Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yael Hungerford, the Executive Director of the Adam Smith Society. The Adam Smith Society, which is a project of the Manhattan Institute, is a community that joins together to discuss and debate the contributions of the free market toward advancing human flourishing and opportunity for all. We are excited to be joining with you all for this afternoon's discussion with Michael Gibson on his book, Paper Belt on Fire. Within this, um, this book explores innovation and the conditions that foster it. Within this context, Gibson examines our culture of credentialism and the failings of American higher education while presenting an ambitious effort to undermine the university credential pipeline. As the shortcomings of our universities have been on full display over the past two months, this conversation couldn't be more timely. Before we get started, a few words about the format for today's call. In a moment, I will introduce Michael and then start off by posing to him some questions to help set the groundwork for the conversation. I will then turn things over to my co-host for today's call, our member, Patrick Fay. Patrick is a corporate strategy consultant at IBM. He joined the Adam Smith Society while pursuing his MBA at MIT, where he served as our chapter president. He's a graduate of West Point and former company commander in the Army's second assault helicopter battalion. Patrick will direct a few questions to Michael to dig a bit deeper into the book's arguments, after which point we will open up the floor to questions from all of you. Our Adam Smith Society direct, uh, Deputy Director, Lydia Pate, will be managing the question queue. If you would like to ask a question, please submit it to Lydia via the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Please note we are recording the first part of this call, but the audience Q&A portion will be off the record and won't be recorded. One final reminder, if you are able, please have your camera on because it's nice to see everyone's face. With that, let me introduce our guest. Michael Gibson is the co-founder of the venture capital fund 1517, which is devoted to backing dropouts and people who never step foot on a college campus. Before his academic apostasy, Michael was working toward a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Oxford. He has written on innovation and technology for MIT's Technology Review, National Review, The Atlantic, and City Journal, which is of course published by the Manhattan Institute. Welcome, Michael. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks for having me on. This is exciting. Thanks everyone for taking the time to read my book. Uh, it's always uh, exciting for me to, to meet people who have read it, uh, just because you send these things out in the world. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. So thanks. Well, let's dive in. Um, you say we're in a period of stagnation. Yeah. That we are is not immediately obvious, at least to me. We have computers in our pockets. And in the recent pandemic, we're able to release a vaccine for a novel virus in under a year. Can you start us off by sharing more about your critique of our current state of innovation? Yeah, um, I think at the highest level, uh, you have to separate the world of bits from the world of atoms. So in the world of bits, we certainly have seen uh, exponential growth since the early 70s. 1971 is usually the year that people pick just as a, as a divergence point. So with computers, microchips, uh, communications technology, I can readily admit that, okay, that we have seen incredible growth. I will note that it is the least regulated industry of all the others during that time. Whereas if you look at the world of atoms, and this uh, includes energy, transportation, healthcare, uh, we have not seen the same. It's, it's not that we have had zero progress. It's that the rate of progress has slowed down so much that in some cases it's been reversed. In some cases it's been flat or in others it's just you know declined compared to let's say the time from the end of the Civil War to 1970, or even, you know, you could start at 1900 and 1970. During that time in the United States, you just saw massive innovation, great improvements in standard of living, and you could go into each category, like healthcare, you could take uh, life expectancy as a stat, and if in 1900, life expectancy at birth in the United States is something like 45 years of age uh, due to better sanitation, innovation in healthcare. By 1980, that's already uh, life expectancy has reached 72, 73 years of age. But then you look at 1980 to today, and maybe we've gained uh, four years or so, three to four years. In the last five years, it's decreased due to COVID and deaths of despair. So in that case, I think what you can see dramatically why innovation has slowed down. Um, so I, because I work for, you know, Peter Thiel has been uh, preaching this sort of a uh, theory for since 2005. People thought he was a little nutty then. Since uh, maybe 20, 
2013 or so, other people started to notice this trend. Tyler Cowen wrote a great book called The Great Stagnation. I recommend Robert Gordon, the, an economist, published The Rise and Fall of American Growth. And so now, you know, more and more people have added evidence to this. Um, and then, you know, I could go deeper in the weeds, but but it just seems to be that the gains that we are gain, that we get in science and technology, it's becoming more expensive and harder uh, to make advances over the last since 1971 or so. so. So that is the background. And then in particular, if it, and because I focus on education, I think you also have to think about what is technology. I, th I go back to the ancient Greek techne, a way of doing things, a craft. And so it's not just about um, inventing new materials or a, a molecule as a therapeutic. It's also how we coordinate or how we transmit knowledge. And so I, I, we can look at something like education. And if technology is broadly defined as doing things better, faster, cheaper, um, you know, doing more with less uh, over time, then even if we look at education, you know, things have stalled quite dramatically. I think we can all agree that we're not getting better at educating people. Uh, you look at test scores, you look at any way to try to characterize how we're doing. You see marginal improvements, but then you look at the, the amount of spending over the same time, and it seems like we're spending more and more and getting the same, you know, often worse in different uh, circumstances. And then with higher education in particular, uh, wow, you know, since 1980, we're up 4X in real terms on tuition. People are going more and more into debt. We're at 1.7 trillion in student debt. So that sets the scene uh, for, okay, how, how, how much further can this go on? Something Ivy League degrees now are something like $83,000 a year in tuition. Um, when, and, and so over the course of four years, uh, we're looking at over $300,000 for, for an undergraduate degree. How long will it take until we reach the $500,000 degree or ultimately the million dollar degree? At some point, this has to stop. It's insanity. And I think people are starting to look for alternatives. Um, in your funds, you're specifically looking not just for people who, it's not that you're agnostic about whether people should go to college or not. It's mm. not that you're both graduates and um dropouts or people who never pursue college. You're specifically looking for people who don't pursue college or drop out of college. So it sounds like there's something about the college experience in particular you think mm. is counterproductive to to um, innovation. Do I understand that correctly? And if so, could you uh, say? Well, I mean, no, we would be happy to work with someone who's never stepped foot on campus or who never applied to a college. Um, I just, it, I think he, in 2010, okay, so when it, let's go back to 2010 when this all started. It very much was unconventional to leave school or not go to school, even to work on a startup. There were some examples like Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, but nevertheless, in Silicon Valley, it, it wasn't as, as uh, popular as it is now. Over the last 13 years, it has become more acceptable, so it's not as controversial. But, uh, but nevertheless, I still think it is true that in our society as a whole, there is this mono uh, cultural path that most people think is the only road to success. And so if someone is a teenager and they're talented and creative, but they're not quite sure what they want to do, everyone from their parents, their friends, schools, everyone is pushing people to go to college. So that's, that's why they go. And then if they have an idea and they want to work on something, um, well, great. Okay. Now there, there's a way to do it by working with us. In 2010, there wasn't anything. Um, so I, and, you know, one part of my book is to uh, just tell the story about, okay, the scene was set. There's all this debt. People are in school and maybe they don't want to be, but there weren't really options. And, and, and so, you know, Peter Thiel started this program and uh, I was there on, on day one uh, to help him launch it. And, and boy, you know, that seemed to really touch a nerve back then. Um, great. Yeah, let's turn to that. So um, first, as you mentioned, at the Teal Fellowship, and now mm. with your 2017 fund, you're trying to, as you put it, short the education bubble. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I mean, we I, I happen to work at Peter's Hedge Fund, and we did have the conversations of, uh, because in the aftermath of the great financial crisis, as dramatized in books like The Big Short, or The Greatest Trade by Gregory Zuckerman, you know, these, there were people who found a way to create a trade that would have upside in the event of a of the housing bubble bursting. Um, you know, that involved uh, complex financial instruments that when, you know, debt became worthless, what would happen? So if you look at student debt, um, it's a different situation from mortgages because the federal government is so 
heavily involved and theoretically backstopping everything. Uh, so th even though degrees are becoming wor not worth as much, uh, the idea that you would try to make a trade by benefiting off students defaulting on debts due to worthless degrees mm -hmm. seemed way too pessimistic. So in, in an essence, it's it's more metaphorical. Is like if we decided like if we could go long on by by investing in people without credentials and creating a long parade of role models for other people to emulate. In effect, that would be a, a metaphorical short of the higher education bubble because uh, we're, we're trying to show that um, you know a degree may not be required uh, for success or even just for a fulfilling, exciting career. I mean, it doesn't have to be some outstanding success. But we started this program, you know, the, in in 2010. Um, there were two key elements to the program. It was a 100k grant for two years but you had to be 19 or under to apply and you had to uh, not be enrolled in school. So that was the newsworthy thing. And, and people jumped on that. Um, but after even, you know, to I don't, the total number of Teal fellows through that program, the program continues today. I stepped aside in 2015 so that we could directly invest because that was a grant. Mm -hmm. um, but over that time, I mean, our performance is pretty astounding. Uh, there's something like 11 companies started by Teal fellows that are worth more than a billion dollars, um, you know, and that's not including Ethereum. Probably the most visible success was I helped launch Ethereum in, in 2013, 14. Vitalik Buterin was one of our, our fellows. Um, and I was just reading a book, uh, uh, Why Startups Fail. And, and it was mentioned that Harvard Business School, uh, in, in the prologue of that book, the professor says Harvard Business School from like 2006 to when that book was published in the 2010s, uh, they had something like 1,300 startups from Harvard Business School. And of those, they had nine companies that become you know, greater than a billion dollars. So the fact that we were taking people who were 19 and under, uh, only 20 of them a year, and something like 11 have more than a billion <laughs> companies worth more than a billion, that shows an extraordinary hit rate, especially compared to the best business school in the country. Uh, so I thought that was an exciting business story to tell. Uh, I wanted to take people behind the scenes of how we did it and, and and why we did it. Maybe use that as a springboard to talk more about you know what's wrong in higher ed. Um, but to me, it just seemed like a an extraordinary business story. Given your success, and you mentioned that culture has changed a bit in the past mm. thirteen years, um, are other venture capitalists now, especially in the Silicon Valley um, milieu, are they more open to looking at non college graduates for investing? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we've seen that there are some copycat funds now <laughs> out there. Uh, one is called Contrary Capital. There, there's a subsidiary of another fund uh, called General. There's General Catalyst, but they have a, a something called like Rough Draft Ventures. It seems to target uh, Ivy League uh, students. Um, they're out there, but uh, they don't seem still to this day. I have to say they don't invest as much money as we do. It tends to be more like, okay, here's a little bit of money to help you get going, $20,000. Typically our checks could be anywhere from 250,000 all the way up to a million at that first stage, helping people get started. So we really do take people seriously and trust them in a way that other funds don't. But it is, but still I have to acknowledge that, yeah, more more funds are cropping up there. And then there are these accelerator programs. The, the most mm -hmm. prominent is Y Combinator. And, uh, you know, going back to, uh, yeah, 10 years, they've been very aggressive as well about working with uh, people who don't have degrees. Now they don't go out and recruit like we do, but they they have inbound and, and more and more. And then I would say, one of the more interesting things I think is, is like the more directly a skill can be measured, uh, the less valuable the college degree is as a signal of those skills. And we see this most in, in software, in yeah. engineering. Uh, and so over the last 13 years, I've met more and more people who just learned on their own. Maybe they went to boot camps or maybe they learned on the job. Uh, there's a, a website called GitHub. Uh, it's a repository where people can upload their code and their peers can can vote on it. This is now a better way to get a job than even a LinkedIn or a resume. Uh, and what's more is you don't even have to be yourself. You could be Darth Vader 22, 24, and everyone loves your code. You're going to get hired. We meet people all the time who intern at big tech companies, Amazon, Facebook. They work there in the summer. And, and I'm shocked at the salaries. They get paid like $40,000 for two, three months of work. 
And then a lot of the times they get invitations to stay and not go back to school. And, and we see more people doing that. Um, but I think it is because either you can build or you can't, that can be measured in a pretty direct way. Whereas uh, yeah, other thing, other aspect, other areas of the economy may require different set of skills that, you know, different intangible skills that you can't really directly measure. Or maybe, uh, you know, we could get into what I do think the college degree signals. And I think those employers are, are using the degree as a way to filter the labor market. Um, yeah, I guess my initial reaction to what you just said is that it does seem like software engineering is particularly merit-based um, yeah. industry. That's very encouraging and fits well with our culture as, as a democracy. Um, do you want to say more about what you think the college degree really does signal? Yeah, so I don't have uh, two original insights here, but I, I'm very much persuaded by uh, the the work of people like Brian Kaplan, he, his mm -hmm. book, The Case Against Education. So there's a, a debate in economics about, okay, no one denies that college pays. You can look at the median salaries of people who have college degrees versus those who don't. There's a gap. Okay, what explains it? Uh, Kaplan and others have presented, a, and, and there's a lot of research now adding up, to show that uh, you know there are two theories here. One is the human capital model. That's traditionally what people believe about college is that you go to class, you learn skills, and then those skills are rewarded uh, after graduation in the labor market. Uh, what this uh, other body of research indicates is that uh, it may not be the skills you learn, but other things about you that the degree is signaling to the labor market. So one big uh, way to see this could be anecdotally. A lot of us have studied some subjects and then we embarked on careers that had nothing to do with what we studied. Maybe you studied French literature, now you've forgotten your French and you no longer read in it and you have a job as an engineer. I don't, you know, it could be anything. Um, that's pretty puzzling for, for the human capital model. Another thing is that we forget a lot. One of the big unsolved problems in education just in total is how little people retain over time. You know, the, yeah. the mind is very much like a muscle, use it or lose it. And so it would be odd for the human capital model uh, to acknowledge that because it means that uh, having forgotten your French, uh, how is it the case that you're being rewarded for it later on? But then in, in, in you know, more uh, like wonkish papers, there's something called the sheepskin effect. Uh, this is when economists look at uh, the, you know, what what is the average pay uh, or wa what are the wages of people who almost finish college? take two, two out of four years, one year, you can slice it each way. And on the human capital model, it should be the case that the, the closer you get to graduation, the more courses you take, maybe even in a linear fashion, your wages increase because you're getting these skills. But that's not what they find. Instead, it's something like 30 to 40% of the wage bump comes after graduating that last class. If you have, if it's, you know, 40 credits to graduate, you have 39 and you're on your way to your last final, you get hit by a bus, you don't die, but you don't finish that exam and you don't get your degree, well, you're going to make 30 to 40 percent less. And it's hard to believe that it was the skills you would have acquired in that final exam that are going to make the payout. So these types of things add up and it starts to make sense. Like, OK, what are what is being rewarded here? And if you think about it, I mean, undertaking a four year project at great expense, handing in assignments, taking orders, getting them done, uh, showing up on time. I mean, it is a very, very valuable way for these uh, employers to quickly sort through uh, a labor market where it's touched, otherwise tough to judge the quality of candidates. Um, there are aspects of this where in the past, maybe things could have been different. You can look at Supreme Court cases like Griggs versus Duke Power that outlawed the use of anything like IQ tests. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but, it's, but it's more than IQ because it is about like how conscientious you are. How agreeable are you? Uh, there's, it's very hard to get through a four-year degree if you're just a jerk, even if you're yeah. smart. Uh, so the college degree seems to be a great way to filter for, for these character traits. Yeah, and also dependability, follow through. Um, yeah. One thing you acknowledge in the book is that a liberal arts education does foster analytical abilities. Mm. Um, but you don't seem impressed by that. Or you seem that seems to be, it gets in the way of innovation. I, I get the sense from your discussion. Do you want, do you want to comment <laughs> on that? <laughs> I guess, look, I, I, my background is I studied the classics. I studied philosophy. I believe in the wisdom of the great books and wrestling with these deep questions. Um, I, I, I do see great value in that. Whether it leads to earning more money, I don't even know. Hopefully it leads to more wisdom. 
But I think it's undoubtedly true that by and large, uh, the liberal arts aren't even being taught anymore. So, I, I mean, there are outrageous ways in which these former majors have been stripped of their core content. Maybe 10, 5th, or 20 years ago, it was, hey, you could be an English major, and now you don't have to study Shakespeare. I just learned recently that you can now study the classics at Princeton and not even have to know Latin or Greek. So all these uh, former requirements for these impressive subjects are being stripped away. Uh, you look at a lot of the course material now. I mean, it, it, like I don't get into this in my book because I didn't want to make it too political in this sense. But I think it must be said now because it gets it's getting worse is that a lot of schools are just becoming woke madrasas, to put it quite radically, is that they're, they're becoming indoctrination camps for far left views. And this finds its way into English lit departments where you can't just study Shakespeare anymore. It's got to be something like uh, how is colonialism portrayed in uh, in Shakespeare's works or something silly like that. So so, I, you know, even if as I do, I believe in the richness of the great works of art and literature, philosophy, poetry. I just think universities are failing to teach them. Um, I don't even and, and I'm not even sure like the course. The way even even in a good instance where it's like a seminar, 12 people and we're discussing war and peace in depth. I'm not even sure writing a 20 page paper is the best way to really increase our receptivity to its beauty or its profound, uh, you know, its own profound wrestling with these deep questions uh, about life. So you do think there is room or there's an importance in a proper liberal arts education. It's just rare to find that. Um, I think I would yeah. disagree with you in the benefits of thinking through something in a paper, but we can leave that to a different conversation. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, yes, what I will say that is outrageous to me, and man, I've read 20 plus books uh, defending the humanities and the liberal arts, is we need to, all right, we need to bring some kind of quantitative analysis to what is going on. There are all these claims about what the liberal arts do. They enrich and ennoble our soul. They make us better critical thinkers. And none of these schools do anything to show that there's evidence this is true. Just please do something. I don't know how you do it. It can't be the case that these are uh, so intangible. We can't discover if someone's improved on some dimension. Uh, and so I, I joke if if even the liberal arts, even you know the college degree itself, if it was a drug, the FDA would outlaw it because they have not proven efficacy. And you look at the mission statement of any Ivy League school, you know, it's a transformative place. We make create, we generate critical thinking and so on. It's like, well, where's the evidence? No one offers anything. This is at a minimum, it's it's advertising without substance. And and I fear now it's actually false advertising and, and they should be sued for uh, neglect, you know, what a false advertising and fraud, I, I have a class action lawsuit. So in terms of your efforts to disrupt the hold of uh, universities, um, it sounds like the 1517 fund is really focusing on uh, innovations to really big problems mm. um, and that you identify at the end of your book. Um, do you want to share with us some of the groundbreaking innovations you're most optimistic about? Yeah, uh, well, so we we invest broadly across a lot of categories. Uh, so I can't deny that, okay, we backed some people making a consumer app, let's say, um, or enterprise software for businesses. Maybe that's not as charismatic as some of the other things we've backed. But I do think it's important to support entrepreneurship. And a lot of the, the you know, if you're an entrepreneur in enterprise SaaS, you, it turns out you may have a lot to share with someone who's building a, a nuclear reactor. Um, you know, one of my favorite companies that we're working, there are a couple too. One is uh, started by some uh, guys who left Vanderbilt University. Uh, they were wondering why it, you couldn't have an electric plane. That was their first idea. And, and, the, and the reason is we just don't have the batteries to do it. Um, you know, not enough power, not enough range, all that. Uh, and that got them to thinking about nuclear batteries. Uh, so they were wondering that, you know, they had uh, talked to some professors. These guys told them they were crazy, but they kept pursuing the idea. Eventually, they heard about us and reached out to us. And they just happened to get lucky enough <laughs> to uh, reach out to me. And I had I had finished like writing a blog post about the 1950s. And how there were all these dreams of nuclear batteries. It's like Ford had a nuclear concept car. Uh, the original pacemakers were powered by plutonium. This is wild. Google this. There are people wow. apparently still alive wearing these plutonium uh, 
pacemakers and then there are people who have died and now these pacemakers are just out there in the world and the government uh, on the website it, it'll tell you where you can send them if, if you find one uh so there was a time before the uh fear of nuclear energy really spread uh where, where this was promising and, and so these young guys started a company they're called uh, xeno power systems they're now uh you know they've got 50 employees contracts with uh nasa the air force and the navy They've developed a, a essentially a nuclear battery that'll be used in inhospitable locations, whether outer space, underwater, uh, or forward deployed bases. I love it that these two two young men have no background. They they did sync up with a nuclear engineer, uh, and and they were able to carry this forward. So so that, I I love that it's like we got to go back yeah. to the future, back to the fifties, uh, when America used to dream in this visionary way. Another story is uh, a young man uh, I mentioned at the end of the book. I mean, this guy's so crazy. He, he, he in his parents' be- uh, basement. He, as a teenager, he was building rockets and messing around with biology. Um, and all his high school buddies said he was like Tony Stark. And this guy wanted to live a heroic life. He was inspired by the movies, and he legally changed his name to mm-hmm. Tony Stark. And, and we met him. Uh, he's working on a, a cure for type two diabetes. Uh, and I, I, I told him, I said, okay, well, you know, to, to move this forward, you're going to have to get grants from the government, other, uh, organizations. And by God, you cannot write your name as Tony Stark in your applications, call yourself Anthony Stark. Um, and, uh, and yeah, he, we, we backed him. He's on his way. He's cured, uh, type two diabetes and mice and rats. He's, he's moving on to another animal model and, uh, possibly uh, human trials in the next uh, 18 months or so. Um, it's now, I mean, and, and this is his, the, the, his approach to uh, the problem has also led, led to some breakthroughs with, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard of Ozempic or some of these other drugs uh, that seem to be addressing the weight issue and, and, and his can contribute to that as well. So yeah, in both cases, no degrees, working on the frontier of technology, uh, or science, and and it's really impressive how far they've come. And so I, I'd love to find more people like those. Inspiring examples. Um, one last question before we turn uh, to Patrick. In addition to our education system, you also point the finger at our regulatory landscape and special mm-hmm. interest groups as contributing to stagnation. Are there policy reform efforts you would like to see to better promote dynamism? First, uh, starting with nuclear, I think we missed a huge opportunity. Uh, some that maybe it's Rachel Carson's book in the '60s, *The Silent Spring*, or maybe uh, by the 1970s, something turned completely around on nuclear power. Uh, it could just be it's it's dual use also scared people. Not quite sure, but all of a sudden, um, the dreams of a you know energy too cheap to meter died out. I think Nixon had a a, a plan called Project Independence. In 1972, he dreamed of uh, having a thousand nuclear reactors uh, by the year 2000. Uh, well, we only have 93. And the great thing about nuclear power is that it's emission free. So it, it really should be something that that green uh, environmentalists support. Um, if you look at the, NAT, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, it just takes so long to bring a, a, a system to market. Um, I think the the last reactor in Georgia took something like ten years and thirty billion. This is this is outrageous, and that's not even the new, the new. You know, that's like a third generation nuclear reactor. We're now on the fourth generation, fifth generation small modular reactors. I think that with some regulatory relief there, we mm-hmm. could become energy independent. If you look at healthcare, the FDA uh, has been killing people in essence by not approving drugs fast enough. You can look at the rate of approvals since uh, the thalidomide tragedy in the 60s. It's been in decline. It takes longer and more money to bring drugs to market. Um, one one quick fix there, uh, and this was, I think in the 60s, this was changed, but you know, there's a two-step uh, phase uh, in their trial where phase one is to prove that this is not going to kill people. The toxicity levels are not going to kill people. It's not uh, harmful. Um, the next stage is efficacy. Well, if a drug passes the first stage and it's declared safe, then we could allow drugs into the market and test their efficacy there, uh, and 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 therefore have, you know get these drugs to people much sooner. You mm-hmm. mentioned at the outset the 
the mRNA vaccine. I think that is a great uh, heroic story that should be be told. Um, Operation Warp Speed uh, is probably the best thing we did during that time. But I'm I'm so aggressive. I think we could have had it out sooner. So uh, the story is wild. It's something like the the some Chinese medical researchers posted uh, the the COVID nineteen genome on the internet, and the next day, uh, American scientists downloaded it, took it apart, and in something like a week, they had uh, what became the Moderna vaccine and others. They were they were testing it within a month in humans. And one thing that the FDA doesn't do that uh, we could do in order to to prove both safety and efficacy is something called the Human Challenge Trial. And during a pandemic, you know, this could have saved tens, of, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. So what this would mean is, you know, volunteers, whether they're paid or whether because they're brave, they could uh, choose to take the vaccine uh, before other people and 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 show, uh, you know, and 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 the results would have come in much quicker. There's, I, I, I've seen stats all over the place. Someone said, you know, we 14,000 people a week were dying. Uh, and so any any mm-hmm. week, if you push the weeks earlier, you can count the number of people who could have been saved by a simple policy change like that. Um, so, I, you know, there are things like this I could keep going through, but uh, I, they could be tweaked. Probably maybe like the, the one most people don't think about, and I get into my book a lot, it's just cities are very dynamic places, sources of creativity, innovation, you know, ideas are mingling because people are bumping into each other. And one of the, the most harmful things that we've done to city, I mean, I guess there are two. One would be the, the lack of uh, policing. So cities have become more dangerous, but they've also just become so expensive. And so in an interesting way, zoning laws are promoting stagnation because it's preventing people from living in cities and uh, and being creative, not just in, in um, science and tech, but also in, in the arts and music and, and literature and all that. It's like cities are, are engines of dynamism. So the fact that we have these anti-urban policies and they're doing such harm, I think is, is one of the overlooked aspects of regulation that's hurting innovation. Those are all themes, but that last one in particular that Manhattan Institute focuses a lot on. And it is also a good segue to Patrick, one of Patrick's questions. So why don't we bring Patrick on? Um, He can go into his questions. All right. Good work, Yale. Yeah, thanks, Michael. And um, yeah, it certainly leads into my first question on sort of cities and centers of innovation. I remember reading in the book that you called the uh, time of death for uh, Silicon Valley. I forget exactly when, maybe midnight, March of uh, March 2020 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but we don't have to focus on San Francisco. I'm more interested in just your thoughts on how do you identify one of these centers of creativity and, and innovation? And more selfishly, where do you think the next one is so I can move Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a tough question because I think some aspects of – the time since I wrote the book to now are, are pushing against me in San Francisco. I, I mean, it's still terribly governed. It's still expensive. Uh, prices have come down. I understand it, especially in commercial real estate. But nevertheless, it's not a great place to live. But there's one shining beacon uh, in San Francisco, and it's open AI and, and the, the large language, language model revolution. Uh, I can't deny that uh, San Francisco is still a magnet pulling in talent in that right now and anyone working in those fields due to that success. So that, that's one where I'm like, uh oh. But otherwise, yeah, there was a there was a exodus from San Francisco in 2020 or so. Certainly COVID accelerated it. Um I left in I, I left right before uh the new year in 2020. Um so I, I was there 10 years and, and, and saw its decline. I I, it's hard to say, you know, a lot of people, some people went to Miami, some people went to Austin. Uh, I would say between those two, Austin is probably the more energetic and dynamic and it, it, the exciting place to be. Um, and I think it's for cultural reasons. Miami just has this, I mean, it's it's more of a lifestyle city. It's about soaking in the sun. You get these outrageous Lambo bros who, who drive the the strip to impress people. Like this is not the same culture as uh, you know, scrappy startups just getting started. Uh, whereas Austin has more of that vibe, I think, because of the arts and, and the music scene. Um, and maybe it's not as expensive uh, as Miami. New York is actually 
uh, also on the rise in this respect. Um, a lot of people I know have have decided to uh, work there. I think as for young people, it's still an exciting place with restaurants and nightlife. Uh, so a number of people move there. So I don't I don't think there's going to be a, a single rival to the Silicon Valley of 2015 or 13 or so. I think it's going to be you know so right now San Francisco is still like producing companies, but I, I think it's come down to where it was back then. And even if it's a head above the others, uh, the others have come up. And, and I think it's more like the set of the others that is going to contend with San Francisco. Um, the old Silicon Valley, to be fair, is like what's interesting to me is Silicon Valley used to refer to uh, the South Peninsula in the Bay, Cupertino, Palo Alto. I think that area is still uh, very much innovative. Uh, it's expensive to live. And so maybe it's tough for people to move there. But I do know a lot of companies based there. I think it's the city itself because of that governance that's that's driving people out. Um, so maybe Silicon Valley itself uh, thrives, but the city itself, uh, you know, just muddles its way through the next five, 10 years. Or like a Silicon donut. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, that's good. I like that. Trademarked. All right. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, the second question I had, just a bit of a pivot, is something I'm, you go into a little bit on the into the book, but you develop a particular skill or craft, perhaps is a better word for it, of identifying sort of truly genius level mm -hmm. talent, not only in terms of sort of their intellectual capacity, but in their sort of someone's ability and drive to accomplish amazing things. I'd be curious that what are the factors that you look for? How does how do I know if I if I've run across one of these individuals? Right. I wanted the book to be a little bit of an investigation into creativity because I'm just so unsatisfied with a lot of the research literature on it, whether in psychology or philosophy or elsewhere. Creativity is very much a, a mystery. Um, it, it tends to be we it's correlated a little bit with IQ, but not really. So you meet smart people who are very conformist and good at, at filling out uh, you know, the boxes, but they're not great at generating new ideas. So there's something mysterious uh, riddle about the origins of creativity. Um, I work working with with Teal, you know, he had these very eccentric views about creativity and what makes a good founder employee. He was a student of a French literary theorist, anthropologist Rene Girard at Stanford. And Girard had these, he, he conducted a study of, you know, he, he was obsessed with the the madness of crowds, uh, the and and witch hunts, uh, mob violence, and Girard scanned the mythologies of the world um, and religions and and collected all these different stories about scapegoats, you know, people who were killed, punished by the crowd, innocent, uh, but you know, sacrificed towards uh, promoting social order. And, and in Girard's monograph, he talks about, you know, what makes up the scapegoat, because in his mind, he found that, um, you know, the scapegoat is often not a complete outsider, someone who's has nothing to do with the social crisis at hand. Uh, on, and then on the other hand, neither are they a complete insider. It can't be like the chief of staff to the king. Usually that person is way too close and loyal. The the people in, in these myths who, who were picked as scapegoats tend to be a boundary figure somewhat paradoxically, both an insider and an outsider at the same time, according to Girard. Now, Peter took this seriously and started using it as a way to, to judge people. So he, he was always, I, I you know, I had no business working in finance uh, and for Peter, and I show up to work and, and I'm thinking I must be this unusual person. But it turns out there were all these other people who were like me, who were some way insider, outsider. And, um, and, you know, so for me, it's like I, I thought I was going to be a professor of philosophy. I spent many years in grad school. Um, I did not uh, study finance. And here I am showing up on this hedge fund floor. So it's like I was or working on the fellowship on the fellowship and now with 1517, where, OK, I have been to the deepest innermost sanctum of the temple of higher education. Uh, that makes me an insider, but I'm also an outsider because I dropped out and I didn't finish. I get into my personal story in the book, 
uh, because I wanted to, you know, turn the mirror and, and, and really say, okay, what makes me different? Like if it, if thing, you know, what is it, uh, when the going gets tough, the weird go pro is like, okay, so what is the source of my weirdness if we're doing this? So I, I wanted to tell that story. So yeah, that, that has now become, I, and I internalize this principle now. And, and when we're meeting people, you know, we're always trying to tease out in which way they might be this insider outsider. One big example of this is uh, immigration. So, you know, there are a lot of great companies founded by immigrants. And I think they fit the insider outsider description because whether they were born in the U.S. or maybe they moved as, as children, uh, they're raised and they're very much part of our culture, but maybe they speak different languages at home. They celebrate different things. And so they're also an outsider. And I think it is that that insider outsider perspective for immigrants that that lets them see the world a different way, maybe question how things could be done differently. Maybe they've got something to prove. Not sure it could be all of them, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, it is fuel to the, the innovative fire that I've seen in, in Silicon Valley. So that's just one trait. I think it's interesting because it comes from this really obscure literary critic French uh, philosopher. <laughs> so, um, but in the book, I go into detail in some of these other character traits that we look for. We just, when we started the fellowship, we were taking these applications and we were too imitative of colleges. We were asking for GPA, test scores, achievements. And very quickly we found that they did not correlate strongly or they weren't predictive of success out in the wild. So we had to think about things differently. Um, one of it, you know, there were some things that were negative, uh, negative correlations. One was the Intel Science Award. <laughs> I don't know what it was about that, but anyone who won that uh, tended to do quite poorly as as a entrepreneur. I think it's because to win that award, you're more of a salesperson or a politician. You're you know preaching about some socially desirable issue, and then irrespective of the underlying technology, uh, you know you win this award. Uh, whereas on the other hand, we met homeschoolers and and those people were like ducks to water uh, out in the world on their own. Uh, a lot of people who came up through structured environments, adult supervision, who were achieving excellence in school, they did have a hard time adjusting to uh, the real world where they had to set their own schedules and goals and work to achieve them. So that that was kind of interesting. But but more broadly is like, okay, we realized, I, I started to try to draw knowledge from all these different disciplines on talent spotting, whether it was sports, um, I get into spy craft a little bit in the book, uh, but there, there are all these different ways of thinking about how to spot talent. And for us, uh, we developed a, a, a set of traits we look for uh, but even, you know, even so, it's like I I, I um, read a book about the real Top Gun and uh, in the book, the author was was listing like the seven, eight traits they look for in Top Gun pilots. And what I found interesting is like maybe six of those eight overlapped with things we look for in entrepreneurs. Now, I think I'm good at identifying those six, six traits. However, if you hired me to try to pick Top Gun pilots, I would be terrible. So I think that it, there must be something to uh, the accumulated knowledge that's tacit, where you're much like in the language of deep learning, you have a, an algorithm that's like computer vision identifying objects, and you need to train it on a data set. For me, it was like 10,000 applications to the Teal Fellowship, uh, interviews, selecting people, and then you know having guidance from one of the great investors of our time, Peter um and and hopefully you know that went into my deep learning algorithm in in my brain and even though i work hard to try to articulate these things i think it's always going to fail because uh there's something elusive and intuitive about about this sort of talent spotting i think no i mean that's i think that's a great explanation michael very interesting i really love that insider outsider perspective um and for my last question moving almost in the, the opposite direction a little bit. I thought your book and it made a really compelling arguments for, for sort of how we ought to, as a society, um, enable or leverage our, our geniuses, whether you know, creative, intellectually, or otherwise. Um, but I don't, and I know a lot of people on this call are kind of, you know, more high performance types, you know, <laughs> wanna, you know very driven, want to get a lot done um, uh, and you know, have big career aspirations. Uh, but what I'm curious about is your thoughts on what about sort of that average person? Like what, what is the advice you're going to give to someone who is, does not have those creative characteristics is, 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 
or is not going to be uh, you know, get, get into Harvard or one of the top schools, but just sort of a your average person going through life in your society. What's that? Yeah. Almost like high school graduation speech, if you will, right. to that person. Well, I, I would say I can't deny that college pays. So it could be privately beneficial, but socially wasteful for people to go to college. And what I mean by that is if it's just this arms race about signaling, well, if you think that's the best way for you to make a living and uh, find a job, then then maybe it's worth it. Um, that means, yeah, you're not starting your own company, you're doing something else. Um, until we stop paying for, I mean, if the government just stopped paying for things, then maybe uh, there would be a stronger market test for these degrees. Um, I would advise someone, I, I don't know, I don't think that's ever going to happen because <laughs> I think that's just too radical of you as much as I would like it. Um, but, it, you know, I would advise people, okay, if you are going to go to college, then maybe study something that, that uh, shows you do have, um, you know, the cognitive skills that could be rewarded. There, when you get into the higher levels of STEM, there are areas where, in fact, you are being paid for what you what you learned. Um, so, but if you're if you're going into debt, especially at these high cost schools to study philosophy and poetry, you better prepare yourself for uh, what you're going to do afterward because you're going to have to pay off that debt. I love these subjects, but three hundred thousand dollars is a lot. Um, so, leaving that aside, then I mean, only something like twenty million people enroll in college every year. Uh, it's not, um, you know, the majority of people aren't even going to college in which case, okay, now we could talk policy again. I think, it, I think I hate that we, uh, denigrate the trades in the United States. Uh, you look at countries like Switzerland and Germany where, uh, it's much more socially approved to, for people to pursue these professions. They're not looked down upon as second-class citizens or, or not smart for that matter, um, we could we could do a lot to establish an apprenticeship program. Um, this could work in all sorts of ways, but it could be the case that people and, and I do really think people are better off learning on the job rather than uh, even at a trade school. Uh, so if, if teenagers uh, you know, want to peel off and, and enter into an apprenticeship program, I think that would serve them better than the current system. And, and they would get the skills that actually do uh that actually do get paid for in the, in the labor market. Um, so I, I, these are the kinds of policy changes I would su suggest. But if you, but if it's like a 15 year old and I'm talking to them and they're wondering what they should do with their life and they don't think, uh, you know, I get this I question a lot. Like, hey, yeah, it's like, what do you, like, you work with the Olympians, you work with the Navy SEALs. What do you say to the average person? I still think, you know, the average person has dreams and things they should strive for. And in the same way that people buy books or listen to podcasts by Jocko Willick, the Navy SEAL, giving them tips on how to live life and uh, succeed, I think, you know, you can look up to entrepreneurs the same way, even if even if you plan to have a pretty stable career doing something. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, Michael. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, and one thing I, I couldn't help but think about when I was reading your book was the most recent South Park episode. Um, Wait, say that last part again, sorry. The most recent South Park episode, there was kind of a... Oh, okay. Yeah, where the uh, where the uh, the handyman becomes a okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, I live I live in a town in in the mountains in Colorado, and uh, the tradespeople there are driving Teslas and living in nice homes. So. You gotta get that message out. I think. <laughs> anyway, well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Great questions. Thanks, Patrick. Those are great questions. Um, this ends the recorded part of our call.